Hello, everyone. I'm going to give everyone a minute to, to come in as y'all are all joining. Oh, look at all of y'all. Um, and then we'll get started. We're very excited to have everyone here. Hope everyone's having a lovely Saturday morning. I'm not going to lie. I never really know what to say in these parts, so I just keep talking. But for those of you who don't know, <laughs> I'm Megan at Park Road Books. Ooh, all y'all coming in. This is great. I love it. I love that everybody's on time. I hate lateness. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, everyone, um, I am going to get this started. People can still come in, but it looks like we've sort of stabilized a little bit. So welcome. We're so glad you're here. Um, I'm Megan at Park Road Books. I'm the events coordinator here, and we're so excited to have Alicia D. Williams, Jacqueline Alcantara, and Vanessa Brantley Newton here this morning to discuss Jump at the Sun, the true life tale of the unstoppable story catcher Zora Neale Hurston. Um, the panelists this morning will spend time discussing with each other. We have some questions and answers for them to talk about back and forth. And Alicia D will start reading and then we'll go into the questions. If you have any questions while this is going on or any comments, which we 100% encourage and we want you to do, just click the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and submit the question or comment. And at the end of the session, we'll go through some of those and maybe your question will be asked or your comment will be said to the author or the illustrator or the host. Um, so that being said, I'll get us started. I do want to remind everybody in attendance that Park Road Books has a zero tolerant harassment policy. Um, if anything harassment wise is put in any form in this space, then you will be immediately dismissed and barred from any future events. Um, I don't think we'll have any problems with that, but I just like to say it and put it out there. I know everyone's here to have a good and happy time. Um, so that being said, I will introduce all our panelists started. So we'll start with Alicia D. Williams, our author. She is the author of Genesis Begins Again, which received the Newbery and Kirkus Prize honors, was a William C. Morris Prize finalist, and won the Coretta Scott King Award for new talent. All of them super deserved. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's amazing. Jump at the Sun is her debut picture book biography. She shares a passion for storytelling, which stems from conducting school residencies as a master teaching artist of arts, arts integration. It's a mouthful, but it's a big deal. <clears throat> Alicia D infuses her love for drama, movement, and storytelling to inspire students to write. She resides here in Charlotte, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Jacqueline Alcantara is a freelance illustrator who spends her days drawing, writing, and globe trotting with her dog, Possum. Probably not globe trotting right now, but I wanted to keep it because we'll get back to it. <laughs> she is particularly excited about promoting inclusiveness and diversity in children's literature and the illustration field in general. In 2016, she won the inaugural We Need Diverse Books Illustrator Mentorship Award. Her debut picture book, The Field, written by Baptiste Paul, was named a best book of 2018. Additionally, in 2019, she illustrated Freedom Suit, Soup, <clears throat> written by Tammy Charles, another highly celebrated book and a personal favorite. In addition to the children's illustration field, she has done editorial work for clients such as NPR, the Chicago Reader, the Chicago Foundation for Women, the Southern Poverty Law Center, among many others. And finally, our host is award-winning illustrator and writer, Vanessa Brantley Newton. Vanessa trained in fashion and visual arts. She is the author and illustrator of Let Freedom Sing, don't Let Ani Bless the Table, Grandma's Purse, and Just Like Me. She has illustrated numerous children's books, including The King of Kindergarten, Mama's Work Shoes, Ariel Glam, and so, so many more. The list is so long. She lives here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, I'm sorry. Jacqueline, you live in Chicago, correct? 
sorry. Well, I moved to Detroit two months ago, so I'm okay. in Detroit currently. <laughs> so let me amend her bio and say resides in Detroit. <laughs> um, so before we get started, I just want to remind everyone signed copies of Jump at the Sun are available here at Park Roads. Um, you can order them online. You can come in the store with a mask. We do curbside pickup. We ship everywhere. We want to get this book out there and we're happy to do it. So let's enjoy the reading and the conversation. And again, if you have any questions or comments, just put them in the Q&A button at the bottom and we'll get to them at the end. And that's it. And if everyone can unmute themselves. <laughs> <we'll get it. laughs> Sorry, I know we all need prompts in this world. <laughs> <laughs> to start off for a reading, but I have to say, I'm so proud of this book. I love it. Um, it came together. And if you are reading along and you have your own copy, definitely don't forget to find all the hidden animals that uh, Jacqueline has done an amazing job doing. Don't forget to have your children find these animals and the hats. All right, we'll get back to that later. You want to hear a little bit about Jump in the Sun? Let's get started. Yes, please. <laughs> In a town called Eatonville, a place where magnolia smelled even prettier than they looked, oranges were as sweet as they were plump, and the people just plain old got along, lived a girl who was attracted to tails like mosquitoes to skin. Zora was her name. Zora got to love and tales from hearing the town folks swap stories at Joe Clark's general store. Oftentimes, Mama sent her over to fetch a little sugar or salt, and Zora would stall, make a 10 minute errand last an hour, just to overhear tales like how that trickster, Burr Rabbit, always got the best of Burr Fox. <laughs> Only thing pulled her away was mama calling, Zora, if you don't come here, you better. When there were no errands to run and Zora couldn't get an earful of tails, she'd make up her own. She'd fashion dolls from scrap she found. A loose doorknob became Reverend Doorknob. The do not touch pear scented soap was carved into Mr. Sweet Smell. And ears of corn were hewed into Miss Corn Shuck and Miss Corn Cobb. <laughs> Zora has stories to tell and stories needed characters. I That's love right. this. <laughs> I'm, I'm like a little kid over here just sitting in the- I know, room. me too. I'm like, don't and stop, please. Yes, <laughs> I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking at Jacqueline's face. <laughs> We're like little kids as you read this <sighs> awesome book. I have to tell you, ladies, this is such a beautiful book, such a wonderful, wonderful expression for any child, anybody to read and to, uh, to learn about Zora uh, Neil Hurston. She was an amazing, amazing, amazing woman. And so um, I just want to just kind of jump in and start asking you all questions. Um, so uh, this question is for you, um, Alicia. It says, how did you decide what parts of Zora's life to focus on and what to leave out. That was the hardest because there were so many amazing details about Zora's life that I, I felt like everybody should know, right? But this is a, in essence, a picture book for children. Even a, adults will get it and enjoy it. So I needed children to see themselves with, to identify with the Zora right away and see themselves. So. She was a storyteller. She loved stories. Like what child doesn't want to hear about a story? Um, she was adventurous and she, you know, got in trouble. She was funky. So I wanted to make sure the essence of her personality was out, but I had to infuse the details in the story versus like the gatepost. Like she, she was in the gatepost or Joe Clark. So I, I kind of added the names of people without having to stick with the structure. And you got an essence of sticking with this whole theme of what did she jump at the sun? You know, what does that really mean? And how did she do it? And what did she have to overcome? So everything else that I really want to add, but didn't stick with this narrative, I had to kind of put the side and everything else I added in there. So this is a wonderful part of like trying to figure out 
gosh, what is it? That's so very hard. You know it. It's exactly. like 3,000 words. It'll be a chapter book, but I had to condense it. Oh, it, 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 was, it was amazing. Uh, uh, I, I will say this. I think you have this deliciousness about you the way you pull out words. I like that. Um, seriously, um, uh, kind of like dining when we go out and you look at the plates and how they're so decorated just so beautifully. That's, it's, you make it, you make our mouths water for more. Kind of, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm listening to you and we're sitting on the edge of our seats like, I hope she never stops. And you become the character. I know. And that's, that's <sighs> even more fantastic. So like, here's- I know here's Jackie paid you. Jackie, I owe you. Like. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we're going to talk about Jackie's pitches. Oh, oh tell me. <laughs> okay. Uh, was it more important that uh, it be about her life as a writer or as a anthologist uh, or a storyteller? Which one was more important? It wasn't important for either one gotcha. because she was all of these things mm -hmm. and to prioritize them. I don't think I'm in the position to prioritize which was the most important. Mm -hmm. And I think for Zora, she gave so much to each one. She gave so much to collecting these stories, even traveling back roads during Jim Crow, Crow South or alone as a woman during this time period to travel to Haiti in the Bahamas alone. So that gave a lot. But to, and to give her stories and tap them out on a, um, to re retain these memories and put them into books, that gave a lot. Even though she was criticized, even though she may not have even reached the fullness of who she was as a writer, as in respect or monetary gains, or even anthropologist, she gave that a lot. So I don't think I could really put one over the other. Absolutely. And they all Absolutely. overlap too, you know, especially with the kind of writing that she did. Like they were all so equally important and they, and they informed one another. But I feel like Zora's like a little anthropologist from the day she was born, you know? She was like so <laughs> exactly. into observing people and, <laughs> exactly. you know, listening and that's where it starts. So, I, you know, sorry, I didn't mean to interject. No, 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 no that was good, that was good. This is, uh, uh, this is great, you know? And I wanna ask you, um, Jacqueline, did you do any research when you began illustrating the story? Um, oh God, yeah, tons. <laughs> um, did you actually get I mean, a chance to go? I, I I did. Yeah. Um, I love the research part of, of books. I think it's just, you know, so fun to have a, a reason and opportunity to dive really deep into something, you know, uh, something that you wouldn't or, uh, normally do. Um, so yeah, I, I read a bunch of her novels. Um, I went to Eatonville. I went down to Florida. Um, I went all over, actually. I, try, I kind of, you know, so there's like, I, I tried to trace a few of the places that she lived um, and traveled to throughout the course of her life. So I was, I went to, um, I was in New Orleans for another reason, but then I trekked, you know, over the river to where she lived when she was down there. Um, she was an apprentice for uh, like a, a, like a voodoo. Um, so I tracked down like her house when she lived there. Um, I went to Howard University just to see what that was like, because I had never been um, and then my a big trip down to Eatonville because um, I'd never been to Central Florida before. And I feel like, how can you, you know, get a sense of not just the landscape, but the people, you know, the people are such an important part of this book. Um, so there's a Zora Neale Hurston festival every year around her birthday, which was, I guess, actually just a couple of weeks ago, the okay. end of January. Um, so it was, it was super fun. It was like the, you, you know, that was like the beginning of me working on this book and it was just like a, a like I launched into it and um loved it yeah so I can see it came out I, I really want to know <laughs> a little bit about your process of how you collect the information uh-huh um you know I have like I, I had a ton of sketchbooks for this project because as I was reading uh, on the internet or information or from her novels or whatever, I just did tons and tons of little drawings. And like, this is like a sketch of one of the pages, but um, anytime an animal was mentioned or a little snippet of a story, I just did a quick sketch of it in a yes. sketchbook. Yes. And then, you know, I kind of started to put it, put it all together. 
but there was there's so many layers to this book that um i mean it was it was i mean like i will show you my sketchbook i'll show you my big sketchbook for this but i had about like three little ones too you know this is just all like notes uh thumbnails little sketches of her um uh, i mean but this is the part of the process i like adore like i love like i don't even know what all that stuff is but um pamphlets uh so but then i also you know did a bunch of research on the internet so i found some of her original manuscripts um that i kind of collaged in to some yes. of the artwork um, I was gonna say that. you can yes. see you can see it some of them are typed out and some of them are handwritten and i thought no one knows yeah. my daughter pointed it out um pointed it out to me she was like look at that did jackie um type this up and put that in there and I, we asked and what what is amazing is that not only is it about Zora Zora is in it with her yeah. own typed up you know uh, uh scripts her own handwritten notes are in this I was like they're embedded like how ingenious <laughs> is that yeah I'll show you so like some of the cover pages from her manuscripts and so oh wow look but, at I mean that. it's amazing what it's amazing when you can find like materials like this. Yeah. And even she did a lot of plays. So there was drawings that she made of her stage directions um, from some of the plays that she like directed oh, and wrote so and cool. produced and everything. I was like, how could you not? I mean, it's just such great things to find. <laughs> um, and I love old paper. I love the texture Me of old paper. Too. So, uh, you know, yeah. So I, I was like, it's, it's just like a great way to start, you know, instead of like a, a flat. A absolutely like, you know I mean, yeah it's a great place to start from I, I, I'm, I'm loving but, this I, I really am so so uh, <laughs> you, you, you hit on one of my favorite things collage I love collage oh, yeah. I love collage and and so uh, to see that in there was like really over the top fantastic um so this oh, is cool. for you um uh <laughs> Alicia how did you balance using Zora's own words uh, versus mm. and verses of your own. How did you, because you do this beautifully, really. Thank you. Um, in any kind of storytelling, you want to, in telling a story, like creative nonfiction for this, I can only use what I can actually quote because yeah. otherwise, you know, you get in trouble for adding or assuming what somebody have said. So I had to make it as this, narrator who you felt comfortable with and then intersperse the quotes to fit them at the right moment so you get a sense of who her family was and who the people around her were and what she even thought of her you know of these things but more importantly I want to go deeper with that because it was important to show the reader what she heard and what she learned so I found that adding snapshots of the folk tales and the folklore um, that you see in speech bubbles. I couldn't add the entire thing that she heard on Joe Clark's porch, but just little snatches of it or the parts of Edenville's uh, collection, her anthology, just little snatches of it. So readers can get a sense of this whole time period of Zora and how she might have spoken and how she she might have told stories and what her life was about. So it was, it was a balance that I think I really didn't have to struggle with. I just, I, I, as a storyteller, I, you just kind of. Yeah, you got you to gotta flow. It just happens, it's, right? I was going to say, it, it's a flow. You but flow. you know, what, what I really uh, want people to know in the audience is that you're learning from a wonderful writer here, an excellent writer. Uh, and if you guys want to just take some notes and just write them down, because I know that there's some of you who are here who probably want to write your own stories. And so you're being taught some very, very important lessons through um, Alicia and even through Jacqueline about how to go about doing a book, right? Writing a book and illustrating a book. So please, please, please take notes from these ladies because you're learning, you're getting a lot of wisdom here and you get a lot of knowledge. So um, uh, please take advantage of it. Um, uh, I do have another question for you, um, uh, Jacqueline, uh, bo both of you basically. Given that you created these separately, what have y'all 
of first reactions to reading and seeing each other's work? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's, it's really crazy uh, to get a manuscript and then to be given the ability to like do what you want with it, you know, like, you know, you just get the words and, um, and then your imagination goes wild and you could do so much with it. Um, but I mean, like, read the first line of the book. It, like you said, it's so juicy. It's so delicious. I was like, uh, yeah, I don't even need to read further. Like, sign me up. <laughs> so, I mean, I was in love with it from, from the start, but I didn't know too much about Zora herself. Like, I was familiar more with the folk tales, like Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox and everything. Um, and I had kind of seen these I kind of knew what who, who she was, but I didn't know a ton about her life. Um, so I was really interested in uh, diving into her life and, and, you know, learning more about her. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was like in love with the, the story right off the bat, for sure. I think it was a love affair. I have to say, when I first saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Jackie knows this. Like I'm a huge fan. I, 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 when I first started sketches, no, when I first saw who they assigned, because editors don't allow you to meet. That's right. right. They keep you separate. And she said, "This is a person we love. Do you love her?" And I, you know, googled her and just checked out. I was like, "Oh yeah, there's so much movement. I think she could catch her the movement. Look at her stuff." And so I was so excited. And then I got the sketches like a while back later and I was, and it's just black and white. And I thought, oh my gosh, these are incredible. I, <laughs> I cannot, I couldn't even anticipate how she would do things. There were parts mm. in the sketches. Yeah, there were parts in the sketches that I did not see as a writer, um, the anthropology. So when you talk about anthropology for readers, there's a moment where I, you have to explain what anthropology is. Not all young children will know. So I have to explain it. But in that picture, Jack Willen shows a big Zora looking at little people. And then there's people when she overheard stories, when she went back to collect folktales, she would listen in on the story. So it was just a different way. Oh. And I... I, I fell in love with the way she captured the folksiness, the magical um, of the story. It was, and then I, I, I swear to you, every time I look at it, I see something new. I, <laughs> oh my goodness, it's the truth. Oh my goodness. It is the truth. I was like, <laughs> and it's so true. <laughs> I mean, I love that because there's a lot. I mean, there's so much from her life, from what I learned. I was just, I mean, editing things out is, is hard, but I mean, there was really just is. so much I wanted to include, mm -hmm. um, you know, that it's like, it's, yeah. And you never get it all in, you but you never yeah, like the all. one that you were, the one that you were mentioning the folklore, well, there's like two. Um, so like coming up with that, it's funny. It's actually from, that was this one, you know, like showing what anthropology is, right? And so it's Zora that's kneeling over with a magnifying glass and looking at these little people. But it was actually a sketch, I was trying to find it, I can't find it right now, of one of the stories where in the beginning, one of the little folk, uh, one of the little, um, uh, well, maybe I can't find it, but uh, it's a guy uh, that is um, watching a little snail across the street and she's like leaving, she's leaving her husband, the little snail is. And he's like, this is snail and brother Lodge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she's taken off because he's like too slow. She, she's over her husband. And so she's leaving and, and the guy's leaning over. And as I was reading that story, I just did a quick sketch of this like guy leaning over and talking to this little teeny tiny snail on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was going back through um, like my sketches, when I was kind of coming up with all the pages, I was like, that is, that could be perfect. Zora leaning over Absolutely. and like listening to this story. Um, so it came from, you know, like the idea came from a, just like a really quick little sketch that I, that I jot it down, but, but yeah, I love that, uh, that picture. It's, it's one of my favorites. That is amazing, Jacqueline. That is amazing. <laughs> I, I love that. The sketch. I it's love so cute. It. Oh, yeah. So, so this, uh, is for Alicia, uh, in particular, it says, um, uh, how did you go about choosing folklore? for the book and do you have any favorites ah well you know 
going reading <laughs> reading Zora's stories and the stories that she collected not all of them are meant for children <laughs> so I had to de delicately go and sift through these and like what can I because if parents want to say hey let's go find them what stories can I pull out yeah. for this right and so I had to make sure it was connected to something that was wholesome and for uh, PG, PG in it, you know? <laughs> and so that was the guiding factor And little, this is what most people don't know. When you write a picture book, you not only have copy editors, but I was contacted by the publisher's lawyer. Yeah. I had to verify, was this actually Zora's words? For her folk tales, were they something she heard? Could somebody else come back later and say, hey, I wrote that, you know, I said that folk tale, or was it common, you know, lore that other people told? So it was a lot more oh, deeper research. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like what could I include legally and what can I include that would be wholesome? You know what? This so is what really I'm gonna follow that up with um, uh, because it, it is a, a question asked. In the back of the book, you have resources for additional reading, but what was the resource or, or, or research process like for the book? And did you uncover anything surprising? Mm, that's a good question too. Now, the, because I was familiar with her, I needed to know more. I was familiar with her stories and her stories are based sometimes a little bit loosely off of Eatonville and her life. Yeah. But I need to know the factual part. Now, you know, Zora is a storyteller. So you read her uh, uh, autobiography and it is all over the place. It's not a linear story. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so the, the challenge was trying to find this timeline, this order to her life that when she didn't want you to really know because she was very elusive, especially about her age. She was elusive about the truth. So she told you what you wanted, what she wanted you to know and put it out of order and it was like a puzzle. So I found other books <laughs> that I will always go to that are in the back of the book. Now, the surprising thing, because she was so elusive, I found that people didn't have the same information. So I will read one book oh. and find a date or a name change in another book that would, catch me up too and so what I did was I found this wonderful research is um her life and letters and it collect it's all her letters like a lot of letters I'm like who can retain all these letters that she wrote to people throughout a certain time period and I would find search in the back See if they have like Guggenheim Fellowship. Is it a Guggenheim Fellowship or a grant? And what year was it? And I will find it in here, oh like to verify the information. So I was all over the place trying to make sure that this was accurate, that, yeah. you know, no one, because you know that one little thing off can sink your book. And I needed to make sure, right? You know that, like, we have to be accurate. They so have I had vetted. to double check. Yes, we have to be check. vetted. And, and uh, definitely when we're doing books like this for children, as much as it is fun and all those different things, those things definitely have to be vetted before we put them together. Y'all know there's a history. Yes. So <laughs> I, had to find a, yes. I had to find a scholar, you know, yes. someone, and that was the hardest part, mm -hmm. finding a Zora Neale Hurston scholar who mm -hmm. would vet my work, who would answer my emails, first of all. I caught so many people that I found on the internet or was associated. No one would respond to me. And the publisher was saying, we need this vetted. You've got to find somebody to say, this is good and whatever. And that was, I could not get anyone to even respond or when they did respond, it's like, I just don't have enough time. I was at a conference and I knew somebody who knew somebody who was the Zora Neale Hurston um, scholar who was speaking and they did a quick introduction and she right there said yes you can send it to me I was like hallelujah <laughs> <And> you, can, <laughs> you can see I thank her in the book for actually being kind enough to say you know what 
I'll, I'll read it. I was gonna Little say, me, vetting, you know. vetting is very, very important. It's very important. You know, um, uh, like I said, ladies, uh, gentlemen, uh, everybody that's here, uh, such knowledge and wisdom is being dropped uh, for anybody who <laughs> wants to write books, write children's books in particular. Uh, uh, so please uh, get down all the information you possibly can. Definitely get this book and please get <laughs> Mark Rhodes books. Yes, this is not a paid advertisement. <laughs> I'm just telling you. You need to go to Park Roads Books. It is the best bookstore here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Barnes and Nobles, yeah, yeah, whatever. Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> but I find the most interesting children's books every single time I go in and I see Megan uh, and Shelly. Uh, it's the most amazing bookstore ever. And so um, Alicia, uh, I, you know, this is, this is just paramount. And Jacqueline, I'm, I'm, I, I got a question for you. Okay, here you you ready? <laughs> Wait, can I go. add can I add something to the last one, Vanessa? Yes. Um, yes. You know, I, I think it was really similar for my research process in terms of just getting information from all over the place, right. and you know, depicting somebody's age accurately from a little kid to a grown up was super hard <laughs> and really interesting in this in this process. So, like, you know, I mean, I got every picture I could of her off the internet. And I oh, put them wow. all in a row and then I tried to get dates, but like Alicia said, they're all different. And so I'm kind of trying to put things together, what she looked like at 20, you know, cause she, when she was 26, she lied and said that she was 16. <laughs> so she could go back to high school and finish high school. So I'm trying to think like, okay, she's 26, but she's really 16, but then she's, you know, and then, cause you have to draw her as 26, but right. trying to look 16. <laughs> Goodness. So I did a bunch of sketches, but then I had to work backwards because there's no images of her as a little kid. That's so right. trying to kind of do yeah. illustrations of her as an adult and then taking those features, making them younger, thinking about what she might look like as a little kid was just like such a crazy um, process, but but so fun. It's so um, much But fun. yeah, it was like, it was the same, you know, just trying to put all of this information together um, and then, and then like find, find it to be accurate enough that it's like, all right, I can go with this. It was probably it's 1932, so you know, uh, yeah. you do such a fantastic job of movement. It was like watching a movie, L literally, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it was like watching um, uh, um, a movie. And I will tell you, even as an illustrator, sometimes I oh. struggle with the very same thing as the reason why sometimes I'll go, oh, a history book, I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it requires a lot of work, um, mm -hmm. you know, so when people go, you know, uh, I wrote a book and I want to hire an illustrator, Alicia, uh, you know, uh, Jackie, I, uh, 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 can I- I did I, that yeah. to you at Greensboro. You was like, um, I'm at, uh, I'm, I'm under contract for the next several books of one that's publisher. Right. That, that's right. And so, I you know, that. Alicia, I know that Alicia, uh, uh, you, you understood, but Jacqueline, I know that she probably gets so many people go, you know, I wrote a book. Well, you illustrated for me. There are so many hours and so much labor that goes into not just writing the book, but illustrating the book, sometimes even more because it's a physical thing. You're doing, you mm. know, you're sitting there and you're painting for hours and everything else. And there's such mm. a beautiful looseness to this, mm. but still a co cohesive, beautiful way that Jacqueline illustrates this beautiful book. And I'm telling you, 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 um, um, everybody that's it's out beautiful. there, please go get this book. You oh, got to get this book. Thanks. It's and like a forensic. Please. She did forensic files. That's yeah. what it sounds like. Forensic <laughs> files. Uh, it, everything is just blowing my mind. When I went through the book, oh I was like, God. you have got to be kidding me. It is a, it's a, <laughs> this, I have to be honest. I did, I did Genesis and it has stickers and I'm so honored and people are like, yes. When I opened this box and I had this in my hand and I went through it, I sat there, I was like, I wrote a book. It was like a feeling of mm -hmm. seeing this, like, yeah. oh my yeah. God, I, I, I wrote a book. It's so, look how beautiful it is. Like, it's just, you, <laughs> like, this is a gift and, is. and your hard work. I, it it's, it's a gift, Jackie. It, it is. is definitely a gift. Is, oh my Jackie. gosh. You are, guys, you are something thank else, you. girl. Um, it says, it, you know, um, uh, <laughs> this is specifically for you, Jacqueline. 
Uh -oh. One of the things anybody would notice when flipping through um, this, the book or looking at the cover is the animals or creatures that show up regularly throughout the book, like the fox and the rabbit. Whether they are from the folklore she hears or stories or her own stories, why include them so frequently in the book? It's almost like a scavenger hunt. Like you're, and I love this. Mm. So go ahead. Yeah. All right. Well, great question. Um, so I thought, well, one, uh, I hadn't had a chance to include animals in any of my last books. So I was really excited that there was like a chance to include animals. Um, but, you know, I mean, there is, there's a ton of rare animals throughout all the little stories. But the most famous Br'er Rabbit, uh, or Br'er Tales, I guess, is Br'er Fox chasing Br'er Rabbit. And he never catches him. Um, Br'er Rabbit outsmarts him every time because he's a trickster. And so I wanted them to be chasing each other. I wanted the fox to be chasing Br'er Rabbit throughout the entire book. And then the last page, we kind of see him like hanging out together, which probably wouldn't happen, but whatever. <laughs> um, but the, the real reason I wanted to include them throughout, like starting on the cover, like on the, on the inside cover. Mm -hmm. um, so Zora, like as you know, she's hearing all of these stories as a little kid, um, you know, and, and like the animals, to like, you know, in the, in the folklore is like, this is in a time when uh, animals talked to humans and humans talked back to animals and animals wore clothes. And it's just, that's just, that's just how it was, right? So, and, and Zora, I loved a piece of her biography when she said like, this was just like, I knew that animals did this. Like this is, they just, they just talked like this, no questions asked. So I wanted them to appear very naturally in the beginning, you know, with her as they kind of were in her imag imagination, but for her, like real life. Um, but then there's a period, you know, uh, I guess I won't give too much away, but a, a bit of a really difficult part of her life. Yes. And yes. the animals disappear for this part of her life. Mm -hmm. um, but they come back when Zora, like, is starting to remember that storytelling is what gives her joy and what gives her like, um, you know, like, yeah, I guess joy is no better way to, to say it. So they kind of come back and in my mind, they're there as a constant reminder to her of the stories that she grew up with and the, and the things that really like formed her love for anthropology, even though she didn't know the word anthropology at that point when she was a little kid, but that's what it is, right? Just um, you know, all of these exactly. cultural things that make us you there. we are I'll stop okay you there go because, ahead stop me you know, <laughs> this, 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 this is so <laughs> so, they come back. so amazing and, and, and I'll tell you why you know there. Um, uh, there is uh, Beatrix Potter and uh, if you've ever seen uh -huh. the movie of Beatrix Potter is where you know her fiance dies and yeah. she stops drawing for a moment and stops imagining for a moment and, uh, you know, here is Zora having the same kind of moment where everything just kind of stops. The dreaming stops, the imagination stops uh, because she is sad, you know, basically. Yeah. And then the moment she starts to dream again and starts to feel a little better about her situation, it changes again and she begins to create again. And that's just how we are right now, even with COVID. Some of us are like wondering, yeah. you know, how are we going to get around it? You know, our minds are so locked in about everything that's going on and all the stuff we've seen. And I'm just saying, you know, this is a good way to sit with your children and to open up this book and to see how this woman went from this young girl into this awesome person that we celebrate now uh, with so much love through books. And I'm just saying, get the book, sit down with it, <laughs> go through it it will heal you i'm, I'm telling you it, it, it will heal you it is excellently illustrated and excellently told so i have another question for you um uh, jacqueline um it says while zora neale hurston loved hats and they appeared prom uh, predominantly uh in the book why did you draw her with so many hats and generally uh, include hats on so many aspects of the book all right, I have another great answer for you, Vanessa, don't worry. Um, so her dad, 
I, you know, I, I guess it was a phrase at that point in, in time and in that place or whatever. Um, always trying to wear them big hats, yep. which was really a metaphor for don't dream so big. That's like right. you are not destined to be anybody, you know, like don't, don't think that you can go off and wear those big hats. Yep. Um, that's not what you were born into. That's not, that, that life is not for you. And it wasn't necessarily from a place as I've come to realize it's not necessarily a, of a place of like, I don't believe in you. It that's is right. also a place of protection, you know, like don't, don't put yourself in a place where you're going to get, you know, like where you're, dreaming too big not necessarily because you can't do it but dreaming too big because in society that's just not it just wasn't allowed you know like it just wasn't okay then to kind of so uh, think that you could go and do that yeah. um so I wanted uh you know her mom to wear a big hat because it was her mom that you know told her to jump at the sun yeah. and so then I have this hat um so I, I thought it was an amazing thing it, that in her biography that she actually said that, you know, that her dad was like, don't wear them big hats. And then she is so known for wearing hats her, you know, like for the rest of her life. And uh, she had great fashion sense, but I kind of took it to be like a, a reminder to herself, like, yes. I'm going to wear these hats. I'm going to wear exactly. all of the hats. I'm going to wear every single one of these yes. hats, you know? <laughs> so I was like, I can't not. And they're so fun to draw. I love drawing hats. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. So uh, I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's like a, there's so many metaphors in her life um, yes. that she put there, that she yes. put there for herself intentionally. Um, and so then just as an, from an illustration perspective, I just feel like I picked up on them and, and ran with it in certain aspects, but I feel like, and the graduation hat is one of my favorites. <laughs> I um, love it. Love it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. That was an excellent answer. <laughs> Uh, Alicia, it says yeah. this book is read aloud dream. Okay. And Hurston was the queen of dialect. Did you make a lot of decisions around including the dialect? What did you, you know, to do? Because you know when I, I told you when Anna when Anna put that up in there and I read it, I was like, hmm, look at here. <laughs> what what she done did here? Done putting up the, uh, uh, like what what? Where's she going with this? I'm, I'm, I, I was so moved because I, I immediately knew the dialect. I knew exactly what it was. Uh, Gullah Geechee, uh, you know, my family's Gullah Geechee from Low Country, South Carolina. But Gullah Geechee goes not just from, uh, it goes from North Carolina all the way down to uh, Florida and then to Louisiana as well. So they, you know, it's, definitely all tied in there and that was that was so amazing please tell us a little bit about it oh my gosh you are you are hilarious to me because i was like go on go on talk go go say that go say that <laughs> one, 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 one needs talk here don't yes go ahead talk that talk <laughs> like, <laughs> like really like when you read a zora neale hurston book yeah. that's what you get you cannot write a picture book and honor zora neale hurston or teach introduce people to Zora Neale Hurston without embracing the dialect. One, she wrote it. it was, regardless of her speaking it, that's, it was a, a choice for her to write in dialect. And don't you know, she got criticized for it. Mm -hmm. She was highly criticized for writing in this um, ignorant way that Black yes. folks told, you know. And, yes. and for me, it was a way, you know, we are so criticized for ebonics or a certain language and you take a race and say you know what they're uneducated right. or they're not smart enough or they're not this by a language when linguistically it is it's the, it's right the language so, it's the language it's the language yes, so it i is. needed to make sure it's a, it was a choice just like it was a choice for her to make sure i wrote this story but then um when i got it vetted it was be sure to be consistent with the way you use it. So yes. I stopped and paused. Besides reading it out loud and making sure I could have the storytelling voice in there um, to, in a way that it can mimic hers in, in a way, like I would never be able to do her, but to mimic her and honor her. But it was also like, oh, let me make sure I'm consistent. So I would go back to hers and see what words did she actually drop the endings yes. of in her writings and 
Well, like, like, how did she use it? Yeah. And even though I, I may not be able to master it like she did, before this story, I needed to make sure it was right so people would read it and say, all right, we got it right. And I'm so, that was something that, you know how, when I wrote it, I felt like my life was parallel to hers in so many oh, different ways, yeah. right? Yeah. And with 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 the struggling, with the, the ha experiencing death, and it was just so much. And then when I wrote this, I was like, I thought, oh my gosh, will people, you know, not get it like they didn't get it with Zora? Will people and the, uh, criticize the dialect like they did with Zora? Are we there? But so far, well, I got Vanessa Bradley Newton's uh, approval, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I got your approval. <laughs> it's, 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 I'm going to tell you, it's amazing for me because I don't want to give things away uh, uh, in the book, but uh, there is the sadness of death in the book. And we in America don't really want to talk about death where children are concerned. And um, uh, sometimes children's books do need to have that because unfortunately it is a real part of life. And sometimes death is not this ugly Oh, very, very sad thing. And while it is, you know, sad that somebody passes, sometimes when 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 it's wrapped in love, when the person is celebrated, it it can take on a different tone. And the way you and Jacqueline tell certain parts of this book are so brilliantly done that you move children to a place of discovery, a place of peace, and even a place of, okay, I, you know. Ooh, that was okay. I have a Wusan moment and I get through that and I see other wonderful things in this book. So I have another question for the both of you. What did you find most challenging, both of you, with uh, um, about the material and about how you worked through it and how you worked through the challenge? So what did you find challenging about it and how did you work through the challenges? Um, uh, we'll go with you first, Jacqueline. Ooh, um, I think just... Uh, having so much material to, um, you know, like, I, I probably had like four sketchbooks filled with stuff after kind of doing my first pass of research. And I was like, Oh, my God, what, where do I start adding all of this, this stuff in? And um, so, you know, I kind of uh, tried to create like a visual narrative for myself, like an overarching thing that I like a structure, you know, that kind of helps me follow um and it's also really long it's like the longest book I've done it's 48 pages so it's a lot of illustrations <laughs> so um so that was a big challenge but then also I feel like just the the weight of doing a, a biography and really trying to make it represent this person's character her personality um because god she was an amazing person and just all of like so funny and so brilliant and so courageous. Um, so I think just trying to get that to, to come through in her was uh, a, on the top of my mind, you know, like with, with every page. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Ditto, so much uh, information. Yeah. So you mentioned the uh, death scene. There was a part that lived with Zora a long, long time of her life of regret. Her mother wanted her to, when she died, to face her to the east. And she, the none of the adults would listen to her. Like, don't let them do this. You know how you cover the mirror. There are things that we did as a people. And she wasn't, her voice wasn't heard. And I really wanted that in there. But because we have to whittle out, you know, otherwise it'll be like Jackie would be drawing uh, 70, 72 pages worth of things, right? <laughs> so we had to whittle it down to the 38 because, you know, but it was enough to, I wanted enough for people to say, I need to know more. I really need yeah. to know more. That is, that is fantastic. Um, I see that my Megan is back now. And I, I, I guess thought it would be a good you. time to take some audience questions. Yes, wrap it up. Um, yep. I, I've probably read this book maybe like six times this week in prepping for this. And I still learned so much yes. <laughs> in this, yes. in this time. Like, it's amazing what both of you have put together. It's amazing. Um, a true craft. Um, okay. So we have some audience comments and some audience questions. Um, and you guys can submit more if you would like. 
Uh, so Nigel asks, what inspired you to write a book about Zora Neale Hurston and what is your favorite book by her? So that's sort of more towards Alicia, um, but I feel like Jacqueline, you can answer part of that as well. Yeah, well, I was inspired her because I loved, basically I loved her. I loved that she, I was a storyteller and <laughs> a storyteller to a storyteller. And I was one day like, huh, it didn't dawn on me that there was no picture book about her. There really wasn't a, a strong picture book. And why wasn't there a picture book about Zora Neale Hurston? Like, come on. And it it was like, it took off from there. And Their Eyes Were Watching God is, is my favorite. I'm actually rereading it. So that love story, it just tears me apart. Oh, it's so good. It's, I mean, more yeah. than a love story, it's a woman finding, make, defining herself yeah. and breaking that. So I remember reading that yeah. in high school and I'd never read anything like it. And I just, I, it's still my favorite classic book. When people are like, I want to go back and read a classic. I'm always like this, this is the best classic book that's ever existed. Anyway, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, <laughs> Jackie, if you want to answer, <laughs> what's your favorite book by her? You can, I know we're not here for my personal takes. <laughs> you know, the, I get, I feel like the, the point in her, I mean, there was so many fascinating points in her life that I, uh, that I realized. But um, I love, there's a, a part in, I think it's Mules and Men when it's a account of her when she was an apprentice for this like voodoo um, priestess. Um, it's fascinating. It's like so crazy. The extent that she went to to research um, to get people to trust her, to tell their stories to her was above and beyond like what, you know, I feel like is normal. Um, she completely immersed herself in in different places to gain the trust of people um that i just want that to be like a i don't know a, a book even in and of itself and um her whole time in the caribbean is very interesting to me i, I want to like i want to know more about that but it be a movie about her it like this should be. really be a movie know, like it, that would be totally fascinating i and mean I there's so like, much it's yeah i feel like so many people would watch it too like so many people who sort of only vaguely know who she is from uh, like high school. Do you know what I mean? And I feel like it would open up so much of her other writing to them, mm -hmm. which would be amazing. Um, and she's such a, like a, I, I guess, quote unquote, mo like modern thinker, you know, like she was so ahead of her time that just her in and of herself is like a co crazy compelling yeah. character for you today. Said it, Jackie. You know, Absolutely. She's, she's so dynamic. Like there are so many, like when you were saying like, writer, anthropologist, storyteller. I mean, she's all those things, right? Like, and it's all kind of the same and it's all kind of different. So I feel like there's so many angles. Um, I love that because we don't have to limit ourselves. And she's just yeah. a prime example of a woman who said, who, like you see in our stories, I don't have to be at home and be taken care of just like they say I have to. No, I can decide who I love and when I want to love. And I want to do this, this, and this, and this all at the same time if I want to, right? <laughs> she did it. It's so true. Um, and so captured in this book through that. Um, so a comment that we got is Jackie, you're amazing. A true genius illustrator. I love the book and story. I've read it several times and discover so many new messages. Congratulations. And thank you for giving us exquisite illustrations. Um, wow, thank you. I know you pe people are loving you, which is fair. Um, <laughs> Maria also says the answer to the hats question was so moving. Thank you. I 100% agree. Whole new layers. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and then I have another question. I have a question from Dorothy Price and it says, how did it, how did it, how, how, excuse me, I'm sorry. How long did it take Alicia to write the book and how long did it take Jacqueline to finish the artwork for the book? So it's like a length question. Yeah, it's not a linear uh, writing period. I wish there was. <laughs> like it would take, it took me about a, a year or so to go through with it, write it and send it back and forth with, with edits with my uh, editor. But then it went off to Jackie, but then it came back to me for another set of revisions and copy edits. So it, it's never, I really can't say a specific time. I wish I could. I should have wrote it down, but <laughs> logged the hours. Well, you were writing other things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah same it's really hard to to answer that because um I did a gigantic chunk of work at the beginning but then of course you know you wait for revisions and this and that but I mean I worked on it for over the course of a over a year um not like a you know like a solid year 
of time, but probably we worked on it for uh, like about a year and a half, you know, um, but probably like, I don't know, solid time, like maybe six months, five, six months. Like it was, it was a lot. <laughs> Picture books take a long time to come out. So yeah, yeah that's very, hard, very hard to say. Um, yeah. Okay. So I don't want to butcher your name. I think it's Irlyn. Um, Whitehead asks for Alicia, can you discuss your teaching process when sharing your storytelling with movement and dance to your students? I'm a creative movement dance educator for middle school students, and I'd love to incorporate Jump at the Sun in my curriculum. Any recommendations Ooh. you have for enriching the dialogue between storytelling, drama, movement for kids that would be appreciated? It's a oh, very like, gosh, loaded question. That's an offline amazing. thing within five minutes. You know, uh, I, I would definitely, as a movement, I would take the rhythms. You know, if you can pull out the folk tales and have children move as the animals, show me what it would look like if you were Burr Fox and, and you were sneaking up on trying to get uh, Burr Rabbit back or show me the sneaky. So if you, depending on the age group, have them become the animals and freeze and then do tableaus. Or she even did chants. If you find her doing a John Henry chant, uh, my friend Maria Blackburn, she did a whole beautiful, a uh, lesson with the Harlem Renaissance, like in here you have the Charleston, teaching them the Charleston dance or, or teaching them the rhythms, bringing in the beats of the Harlem Renaissance and having them create with their own movements and reenacting a story, uh, a folktale just with uh, the voice, the movement and the facial expressions and layering all those things in. There's so many things that you, you yeah. can do and pull out. I wish I had time Absolutely. to like really give you more, yeah. I want to do all of those things. That's all. Yeah, I know, right? You too. <laughs> I miss being a teacher artist, like going in there and just having those moments because you that can build crazy. on it. Show me what it would look like to be uh, stuck up on. <gasps> Show me what it looks like to be sneaky, you know, and yeah. just really playing with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and this last one is for both of you. Uh, if um, you were to do another children's biography book not no pressure <laughs> no I'm, be I'm begging her I'm the biggest fan I'm just the biggest fan. I'm okay. like oh what we got what we got what we got <laughs> who would you do and why and I think that it's meant for both of you who would you want to write about and who would you like to draw about or perhaps the dream team can come together again who can know <laughs> oh yeah I don't know I don't know I don't know what I want to do. I'm going to take a pause on doing the person right now. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> As, I, I mean, I would love if, you know, so folklore and folk tales, that oral storytelling, we know studies show that it builds the brain for kids to be able to tell a story. I would love if publishers really were open to publishing folklore. Like, you know, I know they said, oh, that doesn't really sell because parents aren't interested in buying that. But Zora's folklore is like in all of these folktales. I would love to have a whole section of, you know, different books about Burr Rabbit or, you know, John Henry or just something to keep this uh, oral tradition alive. So if I could, she's, she's already amazing with animals. Like, Come on, I would love to do something like that. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I'm with Let's do it. <laughs> I would set up the section at Parker and Books. I'd be like, this is the section. We need more books in it. Get it together. <laughs> um, I yeah. think I think unless there's anything else anyone wants to add, I think that's it. But we are so appreciative of you guys taking the time to do this. Our community truly loves it. And we love this book here at Park Road Books. Ask anyone come in the staff. I feel like people come in, they're like, I want a kid's book. And we, they don't like, they try to say more. And we're like, no, 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 we're just going to give you this one. <laughs> <laughs> we value you. And we are so appreciative of everything you're doing over there for Park Road Books. The way you hold books aside when we sign them and the way you push our books out there, keeping ch children's literature at the forefront. Yep. We are so grateful for you. Vanessa, thank you so much for being oh an amazing Oh my gosh, host thank you, Vanessa. It's true. Like, this is like a dream. 
I know when you we when when you're when you're down in Charleston and you and you want some company after oh, COVID, hey, Jacqueline and I we can do a whole brainstorming session and bring some tales to life. I would love it. So all yeah. are the invited. All out of invited, please come. My schedule's yeah. open. I can come anytime. There you go. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that, Jacqueline. And yes, All right. I'm going to hold you to it. But it was a joy <laughs> to be right, here. Sure. Thank you. Well, Thanks. the chat yeah. is thank flooded so with much. thank you, thank yous. We're all oh, so I grateful. see them. I see some of my friends. Hey, Marie. <laughs> hey, Nadia. Yeah. I see some of my friends. Hey, Nigel. And the last thing I'll say is come buy it at Parker Road Books. Right. <laughs> and we'll <laughs> give you a signed copy, a personalized copy. We'll ship it. I mean, I'll deliver it to your house. I've done that before. So <laughs> whatever you need, we'll make it happen. Thank you guys so much for attending. Thank you for the questions and the comments. We love it. Thank you, Vanessa, Thank Jacqueline, you. and Alicia. You're all amazing. And I hope everybody has a really good weekend. Have a Thank good one, you. everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.